Proceed. Okay. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, welcome back to the TRRC. This is our fifth AMA session of AMA public hearings. Um, before we proceed, I would like to read on behalf of AMA, the Commission a brief AMA statement. <laughs> as we normally do at the beginning of um, uh, each uh, session. Please allow us um, uh, to welcome you to the opening of this fifth session of the hearings of uh, the Truth and Truth Reconciliation and uh, Reparations um, uh, Commission, the TRRC. The session will run from today, Monday, June 10th, to Thursday, June 27th. During this session, the Commission will continue hearing testimonies from witnesses and the victims of the 1996 UDP encounter with security forces at uh, Denton Bridge. The November 11, 1994 incident and uh, the June 1995 murder of the then Finance Minister Koro Sise. The Commission plans um, to hold this first institutional hearing on the media during this fifth um, session. Our research and investigations unit is working closely with uh, the Gambia Press Union to facilitate this important um, first institutional hearing during this session. The unit is also conducting research on certain public institutions as part of um, preparations for other institutional hearings to be held in subsequent sessions. As you may have seen in our latest update issued by the Office of the Executive Secretary, the only thing that uh, was missing from the Commission's work during the break was these public hearings. The Secretariat remained open and are fully operational. And all units continued work in their various areas of responsibility. The Victims and Support Unit remained engaged with victims, with medical institutions to support victims, 
and with non-governmental organizations interested in supporting victims. The Reconciliation Unit, in collaboration with the Commission's Reconciliation Committee, conducted them as several iftar conversations with Muslim communities in Banjul and the Kanifeng and the Brikama municipalities. Plans are in place some are to make similar visits to some churches in the near future. And all of the, and, uh, sorry, and all through the break, the research and investigations unit worked hard to gather the relevant evidence and the witnesses necessary to support the work of the commission during this fifth ses session. Confronting the truth as a people is allowing us somehow, to raise the dif difficult questions that need to be raised and uh, brainstorm on uh, the dif dif difficult answers that suggest themselves to us. And this is making Gambian society increasingly determined to ensure both morally and legally that a future Gambia will be a Gambia where it is impossible to violate the rights and the dignities of our fellow human beings with impunity. We hope and pray that we all remain engaged in this national conversation with the confidence and the conviction that we can indeed create and bequeath to our children a better Gambia. We also remain grateful and very highly encouraged by the level of uh, interest and engagement of the international community with the TRRC process. Over the past several months, many delegations of university students and professors, civil society, and the non-governmental organizations have visited our premises here at uh, June's resort and held them of fruitful conversations with commissioners and the staff of the secretariat. We are happy to note that their comments on our work are very encouraging and that um, there exists a, a, a rich fund of international goodwill for the Gambia's transitional justice process and especially for the TRRC. We are also happy to, uh, to report that during the break, both the chair and the vice chair were privileged to be invited and attend two high-level international events on, uh, in the United States on transitional justice. From April 29 to the 30th, TRRC vice chair, Adelaide um, Sose, attended the annual meeting of the Board of Directors and uh, International Advisory Council of the Institute for Integrated Transitions in Bogota, Colombia. Thank you very much, Adley, for that. Uh, at this time, the Vice Chair had um, the opportunity to meet several key players in transitional justice and high-level experts on victims and uh, reparations, peace-building processes, missing persons and uh, searches, and members of the Columbia Truth and uh, Commission. She also visited sustainable community peace initiatives and gathered them much relevant knowledge on, among other things, the geopolitical dimensions of transitions, the interface between peace and justice, challenges of uh, transition in polarized um, societies, and uh, the importance of uh, popular participation in national processes. Shortly thereafter, on 15 May 2019, I was privileged um, to attend an excellent meeting of the United Nations Summer Peace Building Commission in New York, alongside Justice Minister uh, Abubakar Tambadu and uh, Gambia's ambassador uh, to the United Nations, Ambassador uh, Lang Yabu. Questions some um, asked to which Minister Tambadu and I replied 
generally related to progress made regarding the Gambia's transitional program, the TRRC process, and the support for the TRRC by the public, as well as regional and international support for the transition in the Gambia. It was pleasing to note that there was no ambiguity about the goodwill manifested by the friends and the partners of the Gambia towards our transitional process in general and the TRRC in particular. A delegation from the Peace Building Commission accompanied by the UN resident coordinator and the UNDP resident representative visited our offices here at June's resort and uh, had a, a fruitful meeting with commissioners and the secretariat staff from victim support, research and investigations, reconciliation, women's some affairs units, and uh, the legal team. We wish to take this opportunity to thank um, uh, High Commissioner Sharon Wall of the British High Commission for handing over to the TRRC an iconic photo exhibition on victims created by and on behalf of the British photojournalists Helen and uh, Jason Florio. The exhibition, called Portraits for Positive Change, seeks, um, uh, in the words of the British High Commission, to create awareness and increase knowledge about the Gambia's Truth, Reconciliation, and Reparations Commission, while creating a platform for public discourse around issues of human rights abuses, end quote. We are grateful for the gesture. Finally, as Emma, together we embark upon this fifth session, we thank all those members of the general public for their continued support and uh, uh, encourage the Commission in its work. At the same time, we wish to reassure all those Gambians who are still skeptical that the TRRC is not, is not a witch hunt, will never be a witch hunt, and uh, is dedicated only to its mandate of revealing the truth about human rights violations and promoting justice, peace, and reconciliation in the interest of all Gambians. We encourage all who have um, stories to tell to please um, come and uh, share with us with the full knowledge that their dignity as human beings and uh, their rights as citizens will never be compromised by this summer um, commission. And as usual, we thank all our partners and seek their continued support and the prayers of um, the general public as together we try to build a better and a stronger country for all. Thank you all. My apologies that uh, we didn't, I didn't start with the usual prayer and the guidance that we need from uh, our religious leaders. But this is a, a commission that I say, here we are, all of us, flanked by a bishop and, a, and, and an imam. You, cannot, you, you can't be in better hands than that. Imam, you have the floor. Can you give us prayers, please? أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الرحمن الرحيم مالك يوم الدين إياك نعبد وإياك نستعين إن الشراط المستقيم شراط الجنة عن أمت عليهم غير البحد وعليهم ولا الدالين الحمد لله هادينا لهذا وما كنا لنعتدي لولا أن هادينا الله الأول الآخر والزاخر والباتن يا ربنا لك الحمد يا ربنا لك الحمد يا ربنا لك الحمد كما ينبغي وجلال وجهك وزم سلطانك وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد خاتم النبيين وامام المرسلين سبحان ربك رب العزه عما يصفون وسلام على المرسلين والحمد لله رب العالمين امين شكرا امام جالا بيشوب يو هاف ذا فلو بليز ثانك يو تشيرمان لورد جاد اوف باور اند مايت the creator of heaven and earth, the protector of all humankind and defender of all humankind throughout the whole world. 
as we begin our session, the TRRC. We pray that your Holy Spirit's power will be with the TRRC, will be with all who will come to testify in this place. The Lord, that they will have the courage to stand for the truth and speak the truth. And by your Holy Spirit's power, you will grant the commissioner to discern truth from falsehood. And help us as we seek to bring out the truth, to bring about reconciliation, to bring about reparation, and to bring about justice for all, that this will be done in tranquility, in peace, and in quietness. This we ask through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much, my bishop, for that. Uh, Council, are we ready with uh, witness um, for today? Uh, good morning, um, Mr. Chairman, uh, members of the commission, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, the legal team is ready to proceed with the next witness. Uh, may I ask the author to bring in the witness? Uh, as that is being done, Mr. Chairman, I just wish to emphasize that uh, the success of this process depends significantly on the willingness of Gambians, especially the victims, to come forward and provide information about victimizations or violations of rights that they suffered. So I just reiterate your call that people should come forward and report these violations. It is only that way we can have uh, an accurate uh, documentation or recording of the historical violations that occurred in this country. Welcome, Mr. Dabo. Could you kindly administer the oath, please? I, Usain Odavo, do swear that, do swear that I, will speak the truth, I will speak the truth, the whole truth, the whole truth, and, nothing but the truth. and nothing but the truth. So help me God. So help me God. You. you may be seated, sir. Uh, good morning, Mr. Dabo. Uh, welcome to the TRRC. Uh, may I first of all say thank you for honoring your commitment made on the launching of the TRRC that you would come before the Commission and testify. Uh, we are grateful. Um, before we start, I just want to set out a roadmap uh, as to what is expected from your testimony. Undoubtedly, everybody who has followed Gambian politics in the last 25 years would know that you would have quite a bit to talk about. Uh, but uh, uh, on the basis of our planning, we do not intend to go through everything that you can talk about for now. Uh, we intend to call you on three separate occasions, today being the first. And for the purposes of today's hearing, you will talk about the persecution of political opponents of the AFPRC slash APRC. Uh, except, of course, for the solo Sandeng issue. Uh, that incident is very significant. Uh, we think it deserves a special hearing. So we would hold a hearing on that particular issue, and we expect, God willing, that you'd also be a witness uh, on that particular, or for that, for, for that particular hearing. Uh, the Commission is also considering holding a hearing uh, on the evolution of Gambia's constitution from what started off as a people's constitution to basically ending up with a dictatorial 
or a dictatorship constitution. Uh, how we evolved from that 1997 constitution, uh, which was voted for by the people, to having 52 amendments in the course of a short period of time to what we ended up with. So hopefully there would be a hearing on that. And in view of your uh, uh, unparalleled legal knowledge and uh, your training and background in public law and also as a legal draftsman, we think you can contribute significantly in that inquiry. So when that time comes, we would also call you to assist the commission in look, looking into those issues. But for the purposes of today's hearing, we would want you to deal with the following topics. Of course, your personal information, then the July 22nd coup d'etat and the response by the Bar Association and your own personal reaction to it. Um, we also examine attempts to have you abducted at Bundum. We'll talk about the arrests and detention of perceived opponents of the AFPRC, or so-called supporters of the PPP regime. Uh, the arrest in 1995, October 1995, and detention of some of these former ministers and other civilians, demonstrators, uh, who were detained at Fajara Barracks. Uh, the attempts at humiliating you during that detention, especially taunts by certain individuals, your release after 23 days of unlawful detention, uh, how the government reacted to the detention by sharpening its tools to ensuring that uh, people can be detained for a prolonged period without challenge, uh, your foray into politics, how it all uh, came about, uh, and uh, why you had to establish the UDP, uh, the first issues that you championed, including the need for investigating the uh, unlawful killing of Usman Korosise, um, the arrests of some of your colleagues, including Sia Kasonko, Saini Sabali, Keme Senjame, and others, and all these other subsequent arrests that happened. Significantly, we would wish to talk about the attack on UDP supporters on 22nd September at the, Den at the Denton Bridge, and also, if you can talk about it, the attack on those supporters who were at around Westfield on the same day. On this particular incident, we would want you to talk about who you believe were the architects uh, of this uh, gruesome rights violation. We would also want you to talk about the activities of uh, the people you call the West Coast Committee, uh, and uh, that include uh, people like Singul Nyasi, Yusuf Acham, and so forth, the, uh, their activities and their subsequent arrests and dissension. Uh, in particular, we would want you to talk about what happened to Sajo Kunjang Singate, uh, uh, and uh, your threats to boycott the 1996 elections, the reasons uh, and how that has resulted into political pressure and consequently the release of uh, some detainees. We would want you to talk about uh, the 2001 indictment of about 100 UDP supporters um, and uh, your arrangement before Boriture, I guess it was, and uh, also the arrest and detention of uh, Alaji Karamo Fati, of course, Lamin Wajwara and Kemeseng. Uh, and uh, significantly, uh, the things that happened to Momodu Sanyang, a.k.a. Du, du, du Telo, the things that happened to him which led to his demise, and also the persistent harassment of UDP supporters, Singul Nyasi and others. And uh, the culminating point uh, would be the arrest of Kanyiba Kanyi, 
and his subsequent disappearance. And lastly, the Madiana 14 case. And then we would uh, end it there. And uh, with your indulgence, we would call you on two further occasions to address subsequent issues. Uh, uh, this is a very long list, and I understand that you are feeling poorly. <laughs> uh, uh, we, we are happy that in spite of how you feel you are willing to come before the commission, we would take it easy, softly, softly, uh, and see how far we can cover, how much we can cover. If in, in the process you feel that you need to take a rest, we would be more than happy to oblige. If you also feel that perhaps we should call it a day until some other time, we would also be equally happy to, to proceed accordingly. So, Mr. Dabo, are you happy to proceed now? Very happy to proceed. Thank you very much, Mr. Dabo. Uh, I, I was struggling to find words as to how to introduce you. Uh, say, flag bearer of the UDP party, former vice president, uh, current opposition to the government or opposition to whatever. But I'm anyway. Not, I'm, <laughs> not I'm not opposition to any government now. <laughs> Wonderful. So you still, your, government, your, your party is still part of the coalition, right? Absolutely. We fought the battle together, Wonderful. and we want to see the fruits gain together. Wonderful. So, well, for the purposes of this hearing, we would put all politics aside and uh, focus on the issues that happened from July 22nd onwards until just before the arrest and detention of Mr. Solo Sanden. Uh, thank you very much. So, Mr. Dabo, can you please briefly give us your uh, biographical information? Briefly. Well, uh, born in 1948 and uh, attended Benson Primary School and uh, St. Augustine's Secondary School and uh, Gambia High School. Mr. Dabo, uh, of course your name is uh, Useinu N.M. Dabo, is it? Abu Bakar N.M. Useinu Dabo. Abu Bakar N.M. Useinu Dabo. Yes. Perfect. Wonderful. Uh, you said you attended St. Augustine's Secondary School uh, in, from 1961. Was it? Was it called St. Augustine's Secondary School or was it St. Augustine's High School? It was St. Augustine's Secondary School. Wonderful. That's, that's important education yes. for, for those yes. of us. Yes. <laughs> All right. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Dabo. Uh, you went to high, Gambe High School and thereafter you trained to become a lawyer. To become a lawyer. Uh, and you worked at the Ministry of Justice for about seven, seven years. Seven years, I did, yes. And then you went into private I practice. I went into private practice. Since then, I'm still in private practice. <laughs> Wonderful. Uh, and uh, in private practice, you went into private practice in 1980. And you had the honor of representing certain accused persons uh, in the treason trials of 1981-1982. That's correct, isn't it? That is correct. Wonderful. So can you tell us where you were on July 22nd, 1994? In fact, on July 22nd, I was actually in my office, in my law office, because uh, I did not believe that there was a coup in the country. I never believed it. And uh, I came to accept the reality when I was returning home found soldiers at Denton Bridge, and uh, our vehicles were stopped, searched, and then we asked to, uh, we, we were allowed to proceed. Yeah. But uh, I never believed that, uh, really, there was a coup. And uh, of course, went to, went home, and uh, took precautions uh, for my personal safety, because I had lived in a country, studied in a country that was ruled by the military. And they could behave any way. I've seen them 
in Nigeria treat important people in ways that no one can imagine. So I didn't want to expose myself to such a situation. I thought it could happen here. So I really kept indoors. And uh, what pre precautions did you take for your personal protection? Well, uh, uh, I made sure that I didn't go out. Yeah. And um, the Saturday, I had to change my, uh, uh, my, 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 my residence. You know. I changed my, not, not actually changed residence, but then I changed uh, my place of abode on Saturday because uh, uh, some uh, soldiers came in to the house, asked for me, and uh, uh, told them that uh, I wasn't in. So I had to leave the house pipeline and go to Carnifin. Um, you went into hiding, essentially. I went into hiding, you know. I went to a sister, Nyanganjai, you know, went into her house and lived with her. I mean, for until Tuesday or so, when the situation was calm, yeah. That, Do you uh, know why the soldiers came looking for you? Well, I believed they wanted my services. Because I know that uh, whenever there is a change of government in any country, through a coup d'etat, the coup makers, their first point of contact with the lawyers to promulgate the laws for themselves. And I believed that exactly that is what they wanted me to do, and uh, I couldn't really help them in their treasonable activities. So I went into hiding. At this stage, you considered that this successful coup d'etat was still a treasonable activity, correct? Well, well, certainly, I mean, overthrowing any constitution, however successful the coup d'etat might be, is still, for me, it is a crime. Uh, uh, just to push that point a little further, uh, I just, and for the purposes of legal education, uh, do you subscribe to the Kelsinian notion uh, that a successful coup d'etat, once it becomes accepted by the people, becomes a new ground norm for that society and therefore can be called legitimate and thus acceptable? Well, that is Kelsen's theory and uh, certainly there have been some other theories and uh, 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 my professor Elias propounded a philosophy different from that of Kelsen in the context of the Nigerian coup d'etat. And in fact, because of his pronouncement as the Chief Justice of the Chief Justice of Nigeria, the military government then promulgated the Supreme, they call it uh, uh, Supreme Council uh, Decree, Supremacy Decree. So that you know, all decrees I mean, supersede. All decrees I mean, now I mean, uh, prevail over any other law in the, in, uh, in the country. So because of how Theo Elias treated that particular situation. Of course, uh, uh, the, uh, the prevalence of opinion, of course, is that when a coup succeeds, the new order takes the place of the old order. So when people comply, then uh, it becomes de facto government. So you subscribe to that notion in spite of Elias's belief uh, that uh, the constitution should always remain supreme. Uh, and cannot be overthrown by decrees. Well, the, the Constitution remains supreme in certain aspects, not in every aspect. As far as the executive is concerned, and the legislature, I mean, uh, they are abrogated. So unless institutions as the judiciary, that remains intact. And in our own case, not only uh, was the executive and the uh, legislature abrogated, but even fundamental rights, the decree even did away with fundamental human rights in this country. And I think that is decree number 30. Yes. Uh, 
So, but uh, back to this particular point, at the end of the day, the Coltinian theory would definitely prevail. As, at least that's exactly what happened in Gambia, yeah. in the sense that the constitution or elements of the constitution was overthrown, allowing for rule by decree, yeah. and that is uh, what obtained in Gambia and happened to be the accepted and uh, the accepted law in Gambia at that time. Yeah, that is right. That's right. That's right. So, but that regardless, you maintained your abhorrence to the change of government by forceful means. That is absolutely correct. So can you uh, tell us how this unlawful change was received uh, by the Gambia Bar Association? Well, naturally, the Gambia Bar Association uh, reaction was uh, to ask the government to uh, return power to civilian authority within, I believe, six months. Because we had convened. I was then vice president of the Bar Association. We had convened, we met, and uh, passed the resolution. And uh, we wrote to the uh, uh, military government that uh, they should hand over power to the civilian government within six months. I personally delivered the letter, and then the secretary of the cabinet, then I think was Mr. Salah, Abdullah Salah. I delivered the letter to him. Yeah. And just still at the Bar Association, uh, fortunately I had the privilege of attending that meeting, having been called to the bar just a month <laughs> before. Uh, I guess I, was, I must have been the newest, or my set was the newest, or the uh, newest baristas at the time. Uh, and uh, we were privy to the discussions. Uh, that act started creating a rift between the Gambia Bar Association and the government. Would that be your interpretation? Well, uh, well certainly uh, the government uh, didn't appreciate what the Gambia Bar Association did. We were on the side of the Constitution, on the side of the law, and they were on the side of power. And uh, we certainly uh, couldn't see eye to eye and, uh, uh, in fact, way down about November or so, there was a little rift in the bar because the issue of the legal ear was being discussed. Myself and some others, in fact, I led that group that we cannot really attend a legal ear celebrations presided over by a man in military uniform, some people who have overthrown the constitution of the Gambia, we cannot rub shoulders with them, and they telling us about the rule of law, when in fact, they have assaulted the constitution, they have negated all rights of the people, overthrown the legitimately, legitimately elected government of the country, and humiliating people, denying them their rights, we cannot possibly attend a legal air celebration presided over by those people. And right. at the end of the day, it came a matter of personal choice. And I chose to be on the side of the Constitution. I, so I chose to be against the military coming to talk to me about the rule of law. Well, uh, I too did not attend uh, that legal year. Uh, I was disappointed, of course, this was going to be my first one as a lawyer, but I had to also support that decision uh, and not attend. Uh, but that too was not viewed with favor by the government, was it? It was not. Uh, in fact, on that day, you held an interview. Uh, could you tell us about that? Yes, yeah, on that day, I, BBC, uh, got a call from BBC, uh, uh, asked about the legal year, why the Bar Association was not 
attend, you know, what was the question of the Bar Association, and my answer was that, you know, even though I was president of the Bar Association, I did not have the mandate of the Bar Association to speak on that issue with anybody. So I cannot really give them the, the, the position of the Bar. But I personally felt that it is wrong for any lawyer to attend such a gathering. That is an affront to us. And uh, I said that you know, I cannot go and rub shoulders with people who have really overthrown the constitution of this country. And uh, uh, later on uh, that day, uh, whilst I was bundu, uh, people came and pretended to be uh, clients. Yeah and uh, wanted me, me to give them some advice. But when I went out of uh, the compound, uh, I was grabbed. And uh, of course, I mean, passers-by started shouting, and people in the compound, this was the Kaba Hydra's compound. The women in the compound came out and uh, rescued me from uh, uh, the people who wanted to, to, who wanted to take me away. I didn't know them. But did you ultimately find out who these people were? Well, I was, I was told. I was told, though I, nev I never confirmed, I was told that uh, uh, one of them was the brother of Baba Job, Mr. Mr. Dada Job. And do you know what name was ascribed to this particular group of people? Uh, no, at that time I didn't. No, I didn't. Uh, do you, have you ever heard uh, this committee for the defense of the revolution? Well, yes, well, I heard that there was a committee for the defense of, rev of the revolution, but whose the, its membership, I do not know. But from the information you gathered, did it suggest that these individuals who attempted to abduct you, including Baba Job's brother, were in fact members of this so-called group committee for the defense of the revolution. Well, there could be, but I had no, I had no such information, and I had no such knowledge. Uh, that's 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 good. Uh, but prior to this event, uh, the bar association visited the junta. Uh, could you tell us about that? Yes, uh, we visited the junta. Uh, to again reiterate our position as to the desirability of the military returning to the barracks and handing over um, the country to civilian rule. And uh, uh, it was not a hostile meeting, and I was quite uh, uh, taken aback by well, not taken aback, but pleasantly surprised by a statement that Edward Snyder made. Now look, we are blind people. You are the people who see. So please, if you see us fall into any ditch, just warn us. And please help us. And uh, uh, when we are live, when we are when we are leaving, uh, the chairman, uh, Jame, shook my hands and uh, looked at me and said, it's okay, it's okay, but it's okay. What I, was he alluding to? Well, when they wanted to, when they came to my house and I uh, uh, <laughs> avoided them. Yes. You ran away. Yeah. That's I what ran you away. were suggesting, yeah. was it? Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. So, you know, and then, of course, you know, Dabo Kundas and Jame Kundas, you know, we throw things at each other, and then, you know, I said, you know, that I was a coward, you know, <laughs> so that, that is it. And we laughed over it. Yeah. Uh, could you, Mr. Dabo, uh, could you kindly translate uh, what that phrase meant? Itewo ikaborile molele, something like that. Well, literally, it means, oh, you, you, run, aw you, you run away from people. Literally. Yeah. Uh, uh, I just did that for the record, yes, uh, of course. Yes. Uh, thank you very much. So uh, that was a um, very, well, it was somewhat cordial meeting. Uh, 
And that must have been the day when the Attorney General was appointed. Was that, was, that is correct. That was the day the appoint Attorney General was appointed. In fact, after we left... Uh, and who was he? Who was uh, he? Mr. Mbai, far, far, far from Mbai. Uh, after we left the um, State House, uh, Mr. Mbai is my big brother. You know, I mean, we confide in each other, consult each other on a lot of things. Yeah, and uh, uh, he then called me and said, "Look, you know, I have been uh, offered the position of uh, Attorney General, and that uh, uh, what do I think?" And I said, "I think it was a, an opportune moment for him probably to continue on uh, whatever plans he had had when previously he was Attorney General. I mean, see whatever reforms." you know, could be brought in and that uh, uh, whatever assistance could be given to the regime in terms of directing them on the uh, things that are in tune with the law, that, you know, he'll be well placed to do so. And I prayed for him that uh, for his success as Attorney General, because there has to be an Attorney General. At, uh, whatever happens, there has to be an Attorney General. Uh, but the, this opposition to the unlawful overthrow of the Constitution. It subsided, did it, after the initial protest? Well, uh, by the bar as a body, yes, it subsided. But individual members of the bar still held on to their stand. They still believed that it was unconstitutional, it was unlawful, and that the military has no business in the administration of the country other than safeguarding its territorial integrity and standing by the government in the performance of its constitutional mandate. But in spite of that personal belief, there was no public display of uh, disagreement or lack of recognition of the authorities as the government of the day. There was certainly no lack of recognition as the government of the day, certainly not. And in fact, uh, processes, both legal and administrative, continued uh, with this new government in the normal way that was envisaged under the law. That is correct. Uh, so, but uh, of course, uh, this new government uh, continued on until sometime in 1995 when there was more public opposition or demonstration against the government. Do you recall those events? Well, I, well, um, I recall. I am driving particularly I, at I, the 19, October 1995 demonstrations. Yeah at the American Embassy uh, when members of the PPP or alleged supporters of the PPP were arrested and detained? Well, well, actually, I wasn't aware that there were any demonstrations anticipated or demonstrations being organized. I was really not aware of that uh, until Sunday, I can't remember whether it was 15th of October or not, when I was called by uh, Mr. Daba Marena and asked that uh, I should uh, go and report to the backup police. And who is this Mr. Daba Marena? He was then an NIO operative. He asked me to report to the... Uh, Do you recall where you were? When, when I was then out. I was then in Bacau, uh, in Wavu, where I mean every Sunday, the friends you know me and, me and my friends you know that's where we meet every Sunday. We have lunch together, and uh, uh, Dr. Sirif Sise, Dr. Borususu, Mara Fambayo, my group you know every Sunday we meet we meet there and have lunch. And I had just gone there, you know, to wait for lunch when uh, Daba Marena called and said that I should report to the Bacow police station. 
Uh, did he say uh, the reason why you should? He did not. He did not. But I responded that, look, you know, if he felt that I have done anything wrong, I have committed any crime, they should come and arrest me. I'm not going to voluntarily surrender myself to anybody. Yeah. And that was the end of the conversation. But then, you know, he called um, uh, one of my junior counsel, uh, Mr. Jobate. He was then, you know, in the security forces and uh, asked him to prevail on me to really go and uh, surrender myself. Which Mr. Jobate are you referring uh, to? Lamin Jobate. And uh, uh, you said he was a junior counsel. Uh, and at this time working with the security forces. Uh, can you uh, be a little more specific on that? Which branch of the security forces was he working at at this time, if you can remember? But I, not sure, I'm not sure whether he was in the uh, prosecution section of the, of the police. I'm not too sure whether, whether you know, so, whether, but, he was, but he was in the but security. But it's Lamin Jobate, Lamin Jobate yes. from Bansang. From Bansang. We call um, him Baba Dilin Jobate. Exactly. Yes, yes. Okay. He's, he's from Bansang. He subsequently became a, a high court judge and a, a attorney general. Yes, you know, we come from Bansang. So, and uh, he was kind of my junior brother. So I guess Daba Marenian knew of our relationship and asked him to prevail on me to surrender myself to the police. And then uh, he came, found us at Divu, and uh, convinced me. He said, because if I, if I let them come, if I let them come to the arrest, they were going to get the state guards come on me, and they would brutalize me, you know? So, it was in my interest that uh, I should go with him. So he, he escorted me. I went to Bacau Depot. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, what happened? Did you go to Bacau Depot or did you go to the police station as was suggested? No, I went, I went to the Bacau Depot. I was taken to the Bacau Depot instead of the police station. So can you tell us what happened when you got there? Well, on arrival at the depot, I a place that subsequently became my accommodation here yeah. uh, found a lot of there a lot of people inside uh, I couldn't identify them because of the distance I was outside and I believe someone I, from the NIA I believe what they say Mr. Mendy he asked me a question Why does MC Cham come to make telephone calls to Sir Dauda from your office? I said, look, MC Cham never comes to make a telephone call to Sir Dauda in my office. But in any case, what is the crime about that? If he does that, what is criminal about that? And if you want to know whether or not any calls are made to Sir Dauda from my phone, you can go to Gamtel. Get your print out. Do your investigations. But it's not criminal for anybody to make a telephone call to Sadaw the Karabajaura. Yeah. And then he asked me to uh, make a statement on that issue, which I did very short. And I questioned what, what was the criminality about that. And then I was uh, registered in the, my, <laughs> in the residence. There I found several <coughs> PPP members, including OJ, who was my classmate, who, who Omar Jallo. Yes. Omar Jallo. Okay. Uh, found Omar Jallo there. I found Hussein Njai, MC Cham, Raif Diab, uh, Sarah Nijata. Uh, Ismail Jawara, several other people, Mr. Jallo, Basamba Jallo, Mustafa Diba, um, uh, Mr. Sise, uh, um, 
Mr. C said he was permanent, he was permanent secretary, yeah? uh, and several others. Yeah. Can you give us an estimate of the number of people you found there? Well, certainly it was, not, it was not less than 60. Good. Uh, do you know why these people were detained there? Well, I sub when I went, I, I subsequently knew that they, they were detained because they were alleged to have been involved in demonstrations or organizing demonstrations for uh, the ouster of the former regime. And they were protesting against that. Uh, uh, you indicated a bit earlier that that place became your residence or your accommodation. Uh, are you suggesting that you were also detained there? Yes, I was detained. Did they tell you that you were being detained there? Nobody told me that I was being detained, but seeing armed men on guard at the entrance of the residence suggests to me that I was not at liberty that I could not really uh, go out if I want to. And in fact, that uh, reality became very apparent when I wanted to answer the na call of nature. I had to be escorted to go out and pass water. So I knew that my liberty had been taken away from me. I was under detention whether justifiably or not, but I knew that I was under detention. Uh, were you told what crime you committed? I was never told what crime I committed, but during the course of the, during the period of my detention, there was this uh, funny army officer, he called Alajikanyi. He would come by 10 o'clock, sit outside there, lawyer Dabo, lawyer Dabo, decree Mali Mutabi, yeah. Another occasion, he would come, lawyer Dabo, lawyer Dabo, munebiela mol bon la wat jumale janto. Could you translate those comments for us? <laughs> well, what I say, lawyer Dabo, under what decree have you been arrested? And uh, lawyer Dabo, when are you going to get your people free? Yeah. So uh, nobody told me. And I was hoping that when this was, gentleman was telling me that Lord Dawo, the Krijumali Mutajanto, if I didn't tell him, he would tell me. But nobody told me. Uh, so, what was the purpose of this funny soldier, it, 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 as you called him? It was, to, was, taunt, it was, it was to taunt me. It was, really to, it was really to taunt me to, I mean, uh, probably you not know, get me infuriated and react. When was the last time? you saw this soldier, Alaji Kanye. When the last time I saw him? The last time I saw him was on the screens of the television. In which context? In the context of giving evidence before this commission. So it's the same Alaji Kanye who testified before this commission? It was the same. It was the he, same. And in, and, in, and in fact, when he, was, when he was even discharged from the army, he came to my law chambers to say that what people say against him is not true. They call him killer, but he has never killed anybody. Yeah. And what's your assessment for the, of that statement? I just looked at him and I never responded. I mean, what is your assessment of I that statement? I, I, th I thought that was, that was a terrible lie. Uh, before, a this, terrible before this commission, Mr. Kanye was asked this question whether he taunted you by uttering the statements you just mentioned, and he flatly denied. What do you say to that? Well, I mean, uh, I mean he was just trying to sh cover up his shame. Uh, he was trying, he was certainly not telling the truth. I mean, after all, there were other soldiers. You know, anyone who mistreated us, we knew. Uh, is it true? that at that stage he was being called Mo Fala Kanye? Well, I don't know what he was being called at that time. Yeah, I certainly did not know, but then you know, because even I had to inquire, had to find out 
because when he, he doesn't come into the, I mean, into the hangar, he sits outside, yells my name, and puts his funny question. And I had to find out from some of the soldiers who this person was. And they told me that who, who, who he was. And, and in any situation, you do have some good people. One of the sergeants, I happened to be his father's lawyer. And he wasn't taking kindly to what Alaj was saying to me. And I asked him, and he told me his name, that he was Alaj Kanye from Jara Sankuya. You can still remember the place he came from? Oh, yes. You must have been very hurt by what he said. Well, uh, well I certainly uh, felt bad that... Uh, uh, a person of such low thinking capacity could be allowed by the regime to come to our detention center, taunt us, I mean, try to psychologically, I mean, suppress us, try to break us down psychologically. I felt, I felt very bad about that. And I felt bad more about it, not because of what he was, he himself was doing, but his masters at whose behest, on whose behalf, he was doing these things. I felt terrible about that, that these could not be the people who should be really be left to manage the affairs of this country. You found at that hangar, as you call it, that detention center facility, you found about 60 people there. Could you tell us their general condition when you saw them? They're really, really terrible. It's we we want a full description, yeah. as far as you can recall. Maybe, maybe, maybe I wouldn't be able to recall in specific individuals. But, uh, because MC Cham was my uncle, he's my uncle. He was in a terrible situation. And I know he must have been brutalized. What did you see? on him that suggests to you that he was brutalized? Well, I saw bruises on him and uh, uh, the still very strong man, you know, for him to sit down for a while was finding it difficult. Those who know MC Cham really know that he was a, he is a very robust person, very strong person. If he finds it difficult or could not sit for a long time, he must have suffered something. Ismaila Jawara was equally in a very terrible situation, very terrible condition. Yeah. He had bruises all over. Not only that, you know, I saw the, the spills of uh, onions when women on scale fish, that that water poured on him. By who? By the people who had taken custody of him. And who are these people? And these are the security officers. And Uncle Rife, he was lying on the floor and there was this I mean, young soldier, you know, protesting. Look at these people. You know, you want to overthrow this government. You know, you want to bring the Americans to kill us. What will kill all of you? Insulted our mothers. Said profane, I mean, uh, things about, about us and our, and, our, and our parentage. And looked at Rife, kicked him on the head, and said, look at you, foreigner. I mean, he had to destabilize this country. Do you recall the name of that soldier? No, I don't. In fact, they, they, never, they never disclosed their names. And Uncle Rive just raised his head, looked at this man, and said, Ntemana Gambian Singla, Nata Nkunglela. What does that mean in Mandinka? 
Can you yeah. translate it into English? It means that, you know, I never migrated to the Gambia. I was born in the Gambia. And he said so in Mandinka. In Mandinka. Uncle Rife is a Mandinka. He just happened to be <laughs> not black. Well, Uncle Rife is Mandinka from Janjambure. What was his last name? R Diab. Uh, and uh, apart from Uncle Rife and uh, Mr. MC Cham and uh, Jawara, did you see any other person in that group who you believe to have been brutalized, as you call it? Well, well uh, virtually, I, I, I think virtually, virtually all of them, virtually all of them were brutalized. You know, so I think, I, I think, can, I, can I think, I think I was the one, I was the only lucky one who was not subjected to any physical torture. So by brutalize, you mean torture? Yes. So, and you are the only one who was spared. I believe, I believe I was the only one who escaped it. Uh, there were some women who were detained with this group. Are you aware of that? Well, yes, yes. Uh, I know Kosotelo, Adamasise, and Mama, um, Mama Jawara. You know? But uh, I believe uh, they were taken to the Banjul Station. And now that we have uh, talked about the conditions in which you saw these people, let's talk about the conditions of detention. Say the physical conditions of the hunger and uh, general conditions in which you were detained. You know, the hunger is, uh, of course, the place that you use for uh, maintenance of vehicles, you know, I mean, uh, changing of oil and so forth. Uh, we had a, uh, an old, dirty tarpaulin that was our bedding. And of course, uh, uh, insects crawling all over us. It was hot and uh, uh, not permitted to have bath, no change of clothing. And, uh, uh, no food, and I mean no food, food that, you know, we are accustomed to eating. In fact, uh, when we manage to smuggle in piled peanut, we call that filet. Yeah. So it was a real terrible condition. Would you describe those conditions as humane? I think the conditions were sordid and squalid. And uh, you indicated that uh, some of your colleagues there were brutalized. Do you know whether any one of them has been allowed to go out and receive medical treatment? No, none. None was allowed to go out to get medical treatment. Personally, did you suffer any physical injuries? I did not suffer any physical injuries, but I had infection. You know, because for several days I never had a bath, even the smell of my body, I found it nauseating. I would want to vomit when I raised my arms and my odor coming from my armpit, find it nauseating, I want to vomit. And uh, my umbilicals, you know, sweat, you know, settled in, and then, you know, got infected. You mean so, your belly button? That, that, that's right. And then uh, had a, uh, quote unquote, a nephew, because it's a nephew to a friend, who was in the pyramid of the, uh, of the police. Yeah. He, when he learned of my condition, he came in and uh, arranged that uh, in the evenings, when all officers are away, he could come in and uh, attend to me. Yeah. He'll clean, 
they would clean the infected area and uh, with Dettol and uh, give me some uh, uh, antibiotics to drink. And then he would take the rest away so that nothing is found on me. And in that process too, uh, he would arrange for uh, Dr. Borosuso, my friend, to come and see me so that he could go tell the family that at least I am alive and that uh, I'm not suffering any, any, any ailment. Yeah. And uh, uh, on occasions too, they will bring a sawarama for me, which I would, uh, <laughs> which I would consume before, uh, before I'm taken back into the cells. Yes. So he was very kind. He's in the naval um, uh, unit of the Gambia Armed Forces. He's Mr. Sedi. Uh, do you know whether your 60-odd other colleagues had that opportunity? No. And uh, for how long were you kept detained in that condition? I was kept detained in that condition for, I think, about 23 or 24 days when I, uh, when I, when I was released. At, during this period, were you taken before any court of law? I was never taken before any court of law, nor was I taken before any administrative tribunal. At that time, what was the longest period of pre-trial, of uh, pre-appearance uh, uh, period for detention? The longest period you could be detained without charge. What well, was the period at the time? Well, 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 it's a, it's a, uh, Council, I, think the, I think this was even the time when the human rights provisions in the Constitution were abrogated. Uh, so we had to rely on the common law, on the common law, and uh, it should be reasonable as, I mean, uh, as soon as practicable. Yes, sir. But even at this stage, uh, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, I think the detention period was extended to 72 hours, uh, and uh, it was subsequently that a decree was passed allowing for uh, a period of detention, uh, pro prolonged period of detention uh, without challenge. Uh, I guess that was the case, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah, the, the decree was promulgated a day after my release because I certainly was going to sue for unlawful detention. And I think it was to preempt me and others who might want to sue the government for unlawful detention that that decree was, was promulgated. And you were released, and what happened to your colleagues with whom you were in detention? My colleagues, they remained in detention until about um, uh, January 1997. They continued. Almost for how many months? Almost one year. More, more than another, one year. More, another one year. More than one year. More than one year. Because they were not, they were still in detention when the presidential elections took place in September of 1996. And it was before the National Assembly elections of 1997 that they were released. And they were released because the United Democratic Party made it a condition of its participation in the National Assembly election that these people must be released from detention. What do you say to the suggestion uh, that uh, these people were released because uh, some government official made arrangements with the Imam Ratib of Banjul to go and plead with uh, Chairman Jam. I'm not aware of that. What I'm aware of is that we made it a condition because already presidential elections had been universally acclaimed to be very flawed elections. And I believe the government, in order to have any credibility, had to give in to the demands 
of the United Democratic Party to have these people released. Would you say that it is self-serving if, uh, say, I tell you that Babu Karjata, who had responsibility for Fajara Barracks at the time, and therefore control, physical control over those who were detained, but do you say to the suggestion that he organized the release by sending or asking the Imam of Banjo to go to Jami and plead with him to secure the release of the detainees. Would you suggest that, uh, or would you say that is self-serving? I'm not aware that he is this, so what I know is the United Democratic Party put pressure on the government to do so. And in any case, why would Babu Karjata do things through the Imam of the River Banjol? He was the person in charge of the detainees. He had enough influence in the position that he held in government to persuade his principal to tell him, bring to his attention the unlawfulness of what was being done and ask that he be released. He didn't have to go through any other person. I don't believe so. So you maintain that these people were released, were released mainly because of the political because of the pressure? Po because of political pressure, that's Put all. On the government? On by the government, the yes. So prior to the release of these individuals, uh, you started a foray into politics. Could you tell us about that? Yes. Uh, actually, my uh, involvement in politics was not anything designed, was unplanned. In uh, August of, 20, of 1996, I returned from the United States and uh, uh, I had found that um, people belonging to other parties that we are banned decided to come together to form a party to challenge the incumbent who was also preparing himself to contest as a civilian President. And who are you referring to? I'm referring to uh, some members of PPP, some members of NCP, and some members of GPP. Those are the people who came together it, and asked to organize under an umbrella led by yourself? That is correct. Okay. But who was the incumbent? Yaya yeah, Jame. Yaya yeah, Jame was the incumbent. Yeah. Okay. And uh, of course, uh, uh, it was not an easy decision, and in fact, it was an decision that I could take just by myself. I had family, I had friends. I knew the situation in the country was such that whatever de decision one takes on those lines could also affect your family, could affect your friends. Uh, we are interested in understanding what was the environment like at that time? And, uh, and of course, that would inform or would set color or light on the enormity of that decision at the time. Of course, the environment was uh, one that was hostile to any challenge to uh, Jamie's political aspirations. And that is why other parties, particularly the ruling party, that's why they were banned from taking part in the political life of the country. The leading personal, the leading figures in all these, on all these parties were all banned because Yajame did not want to have any opposition to him that will really uh, shake I mean, his position. He wanted to make sure that he had an easy ride. So anyone really willing to uh, lead any party that is uh, formed by PPP, GPP, and uh, NCP will certainly be a formidable force, and Yajame will certainly fight against such a 
party by any means and at all costs, and as, and as it has came, it just became uh, later on, later on, as you will see, how much he detested UDP and how much he did to make sure that UDP does not strive in this country. Do you recall the individual who called you while you were in the U.S. to tell you that uh, they wanted you to lead a political party? Well, actually, uh, one of my friends, Alaji Seku Kante, popularly known as Job Kante, and I even wondered how he was able to get <laughs> the phone number. I, was, I wondered how, how he was able to get it. But then I didn't give any response until when I had consultations with my family. And uh, I must say, I was probably have decided when I got to summer to refill my car, a gentleman, thick bearded gentleman on a motor bicycle came by, stood by my car, looked at me, looked at me, and said, lawyer double at empty bank. I said, tell him, ha, tell him. And then he said, I can't more let you go I can't more let you go what does that mean in English? He said, I should not betray their confidence. The first phrase? The first phrase was, no, he repeated this three times. He said, aren't you lawyer Dabo? I said, yes, I am. And then he said, please, don't betray our confidence. Don't betray our confidence. Don't betray our confidence. And, and what did you understand him And tears started rolling down his cheeks. And that really had some impact on me. What did you think he was referring to when he said, don't betray our confidence? I, remember, I think he was referring to the fact that uh, I shouldn't re turn down the leadership of the United Democratic because what had gone wrong, the Gambia, that I was being considered that I'm in fact thinking about it. So what had gone around? The already people were harboring expectations, expectations that you would lead the that, party. That, that, that I would lead the party. And this was the only viable and credible opposition to Yaya Jami's aspirations at the time? Absolutely, absolutely. So kindly tell us what are the first activities you championed when you decided to join or to lead this new party in opposition to Jami? Well, of course, I mean, the first activity was really the launching of the party, uh, which we had uh, scheduled to take place in Brikama. And uh, unfortunately, we couldn't launch the party because of I mean, the crowd was so huge that uh, my personal security uh, for me became an issue because anything could happen in that crowd. We didn't have uh, the security that could protect, could, that could protect me. And uh, we had to really postpone the launching and we did so the following week at Fitzgerald. Where? Fitzgerald Street. Fitzgerald Street, Fitzgerald in, Street Banjul. in Banjul. And uh, it was at uh, this uh, uh, launching of the party that uh, I talked about our vision for the Gambia. I mean, the, uh, we talked about how we want to enthrone the rule of law in this country and uh, do away with dictatorship and all its vestiges, never to appear in this country again, that the corruption that was uh, taking root, you know, we must make sure that is abated. I made reference to the $3 million that was uh, um, stolen and dumped in a Swiss bank account because I had got documents affidavits 
and I challenged them that if I was, if they think that I was saying anything that was not true, I could be taken to court. And of course, uh, and the, can you tell us a little more about that accusation that you made against the government, three million dollars? Uh, Who was alleged to have stolen that money? Well, uh, Ibu Jalo was alleged to have stolen that money, but we have had evidence that Ibu Jalo alone didn't benefit from that stolen, uh, from, 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 from the money stolen. We had evidence that Yai Jame had an account opened in Switzerland in his name, and monies were deposited in that account. And in fact, after that, after I made that uh, revelation, I discovered another affidavit sworn to by Sam Sar, Samuel Sar, in Senegal, confirming that three million dollars was taken away, and that on the pretext that they were going to buy onions and so forth for the Gambian populace, and some of these monies were put in Yajames' uh, personal account. I started revealing their corruption. And I said that when we come into power, Korosis's mother must be investigated. And I call on the government that it should investigate it because it's just, it's just unimaginable how a state minister can die in the circumstances in which Korosis was found and no credible investigation conducted. And I believed that the regime was probably responsible for it. That is why no investigations was launched. And I called for an investigation. And I said that we have to do this. And there was protest to the IEC by Edward Snate that- And what was his protest? That, uh, that, that what I was uh, making reference to about Koro Sile, that was not an issue for the election. But the, cha the chairman of the PIEC then I mean, reaction was that this was a legitimate issue for the Gambians. So I, ha I was not really uh, doing anything that was in breach of the code of conduct. Uh, you said earlier that there was no investigations. Why do you think there was no investigations of such a significant murder? We have not had any report from the government to say that they have conducted investigations and this was the result. Whether culprits were apprehended or not, there was no, su there was no such report. And so I believe that it was, a, it was deliberate. On the part of who? On the part of the government, headed by Ayajame. To do what? To really suppress evidence. So in fact, you suggesting the government was covering up that crime. The government was covering up, the gov government was covering up its own crimes. In fact, you are accusing the government of having committed the murder. I am accusing the government of being complicit in the murder. Thank you very much. It's time for our first break. Uh, thank you very much, um, uh, Mr. Dabo, for that um, uh, testimony. Um, Council, I think we would reserve our questions maybe the end of the afternoon session. Mr. Dabo, notwithstanding the long trip from the Middle East, seems to be uh, pretty strong. He has a lot of energy. I think TRRC energizes people. So he is sufficiently energized, and uh, we can continue and then reserve our questions until the, uh, and the end of the afternoon session. For the moment, we would take a 30-minute break and come back at 12 noon. Meeting is adjourned. <laughs>